Hello and welcome to um, a special edition of Blytheway Business News, which we've called Driving the Revolution. Revolution with a large EV. You can see what we did there. We've been joined today in a couple of days time for episode two by a group of mining executives who are either producing or developing the metals and minerals which are being used for the EV revolution. Um, I'm gonna to go to the panel now, just ask them each to introduce themselves and kind of start with you, Nigel, Nigel Robinson. Hello, my name is Nigel Robinson. I'm the Chief Executive Officer of Central Asia Metals and we're listed on the London Stock Exchange AIM market. We produce copper in Kazakhstan and also lead and zinc in North Macedonia. And now can I go to Tim Harrison, please? Hi, my name is Tim Harrison. I'm the Managing Director of Ionic Rare Earths. We're an Australian listed company. We're developing a rare earth project in Uganda. Anne Oxley. Hello, I'm Anne Oxley. I'm a co-founder and the technical director of Brazilian Nickel. And we pretty much do what it says on the can, but we are doing, we have a nickel project in Brazil, uh, which we are in construction with at the moment. And talking of doing what it says on the can, can I now come to Jeremy Raffle? Jeremy. I was going to say, absolutely, it does what it says on the tin with us too. So my name is Jeremy Raffle. I'm the founder and CEO of Cornish Lithium, a company exploring for lithium in Cornwall from brine sources and hard rock sources. Thank you all and welcome to the show. I'm going to start with what many may see, certainly in the UK and Europe, as an, as an ironic question as we sit here with petrol shortages uh, bringing the country to a bit of a, not quite a standstill. But look, we are seeing uh, an increase in demand for the metals, the materials required for the green revolution for electric vehicles. Why are we seeing that? What, what is really behind it? Can I, can I start with you, Anne? What's your view? Well, I think as, as the world is beginning to decarbonize, you know, we, we need all these metals for, for the green revolution. You know, whether we're looking at renewable energy or the batteries themselves for, for lithium ion batteries for electric vehicles. You know, I mean, somebody sent me some information just the other day that at the moment there's apparently that just in Europe, there's a thousand gigawatt hours of lithium ion battery manufacturing that is either in construction or planning, you know, and if that was all online, that would require just from a nickel perspective around 400,000 tons of nickel. And to put that in some sort of perspective, you know, that's actually over 20% of the total global production in 2020, you know, and that is completely new demand. And that is just in Europe for nickel. So, you know, it is an exceptional circumstance I think we find ourselves in at the moment, unprecedented times for the requirement of these metals if we are to meet, you know, our carbon targets. And, and Anne, you're very much concerned with the batteries, the nickel is going to the batteries. Let me come to Tim Harrison, which of course, Tim, you're much more concerned, I guess, with magnets. But what's your view? Why are we seeing this, this incredible increase in demand? I think there's a there's a growing global awareness and a desire to, um, you know, minimise our, our carbon footprint as a society. I think the social norms uh, are pushing us towards, you know, um, working in a or well, adopting technologies that, you know, reduce the, the burden in the future. Um, and so with that, that social norm, the expectation, um, the growing commitments from governments, stimulus um, to push us towards uh, being able to electrify fleets globally um, and to, I suppose, reduce our dependence on, on carbon, on, on fossil fuels, uh, move towards an environment where we do have um, less of an impact on global temperatures. And uh, I think, yeah, the expectation is there from across the board that we all do our bit um, to, to, to reduce the impact on the environment. No, Nigel, let me come to you because you're actually mining copper, lead, zinc. Um, what in your view is, is driving the demand? Well, yeah, we are, Tim. And, and one of the key metals in this green revolution that we're talking about is, is copper. I mean, copper is fundamental to, to anybody achieving any kind of net zero target that we'll talk about later. But um, 
For example, in an electric vehicle itself, you require four more, uh, four times more copper, should I say, than an internal combustion engine. So the change over to electric vehicles is going to see a significant increase, not just in the copper that's required within the vehicle itself, but also the infrastructure that we need to actually support charging vehicles, et cetera, et cetera. And then the renewable electricity that needs to be transferred over to the various charging points. So obviously a clear increase in demand for copper in the coming future with this uh, transfer over to renewable energies. Um, substitution is very difficult on copper. So copper has got a great future, we believe, and we're very bullish about the future for copper. But the other two metals that we produce as well, lead and zinc, they've got a future in a sustainable world. I mean, lead is used in lead acid batteries, about 80% of the world's uh, the production of lead, should I say, is used in lead acid batteries. And even though that's that's almost seen as a dirty metal in some ways, we move towards these you know, new technologies and new battery metals. There is still a requirement for lead acid batteries in cars to drive the systems within a car, albeit smaller, but still a demand, so an increasing demand you know, for lead as we look forward into the future. And finally, zinc is used in galvanization of metals. And therefore, in a sustainable world, you really want to be galvanizing metals. So the metals last longer, stainless steel will last longer if it's galvanized. And as, as Anne rightly said, we have seen an explosion in, in the kind of push for build back better, a phrase I don't personally like, I must say, but, uh, you know, renewable energy, et cetera, et cetera. We've seen a major push for that. And I think the, the conference coming up in Glasgow, COP26, as they're calling, will see a renew, renewed increase in vigor towards the, the kind of methods we're talking about on this platform. Okay. Now, Nigel, you're mining in Kazakhstan, in North Macedonia. Tim, you're operating in Uganda and you're in Brazil. I'm going to come to Jeremy because Jeremy, of, of our panellists, uh, you're the one who's actually operating in the UK, inside uh, Western Europe. Um, it's all very well mining these, let's call them these green metals, these green minerals, um, but how important uh, is the supply chain in all of this? How important is Europe uh, having a, a secure supply chain for itself? Um, Tim, thanks for that question. I, I think it's obviously of huge importance, not just because um, of the, su the supply itself, it's the fact we've got to overlay uh, ESG concerns on that supply as well. And really, that ESG concerns have only really come in the last, say, five years and accelerated of, 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 to be of even greater concern. Where's the metal coming from? Is it green? Um, is it is, what? Are, what's the associated carbon footprint? And particularly the case in in Europe, because if some of these car manufacturers uh, are unable to answer where that material, say the lithium, the nickel, wherever came from, and how it was sourced, and how much carbon was associated with it, people simply won't want to buy their cars. So Europe at the moment produces um, <clears throat> about twelve point nine, nearly thirteen million cars a year, and is it is a major, major industry for, for Europe. Um, it's one of the, the second biggest uh, export industry for the UK is automotive uh, industry and exports of, of cars, but hugely important that we not only source this material ethically, but we actually source it full stop. So we're not reliant on countries like China. Um, China has really thought this through very, very carefully. They produce 80% of the world's lithium um, battery chemicals, so refined battery chemicals, and have really tied that up. And obviously, as we get more concerned, uh, sadly, about the um, trade links with China, we really do have to think about how much we are dependent on that. So at the moment, lith um, Europe produces no lithium at all, uh, battery grade lithium, uh, from, raw, from raw sources in Europe. And unfortunately, that is a, a major challenge. The, the European automotive industry has rapidly moved towards electric vehicles, but really hasn't thought about where these metals are going to come from. I was talking to an automotive industry um, executive last week. He said to me, but why are you worried? Um, lithium is an abundant element. And, and I said, yes, it is. It's probably in my garden, but nobody's in a rush to buy in my garden because it's too low grade. It's really not is it abundant element? It's where is it economic? And I'm sure that everybody on this uh, panel would agree that it's it's where can you extract it? Where is it economically extractable? And also, where have you got the social license to actually do it? If I was to say I was going to go and dig a big hole in Germany or in the UK, uh, in most regions, that wouldn't go down too well. And you really do have to have a, a license to operate. And, and I think 
it it is a big big issue for for Europe to sort that out. So it's economic concerns, it's it's social license to operate, and it's um, it's ESG all overlaid on top of each other. So as you said there, at the moment, Europe is providing or supplying no battery grade lithium uh, for its indigenous automotive industry. Anne referred earlier on to the, uh, the huge demand for nickel, which at the moment is not being fulfilled. How are the markets for each of these metals, you know, lithium, graphite, rare earth, copper, cobalt, as many of these are, let's call them new metals uh, or newly fashionable metals. Um, how are the markets reacting for this surge in demand uh, and I suppose the, sub, the imbalance of supply? Tim, let's just come to you first. How, how do you see the rare earths market reacting? Good question, Tim. Uh, look, I think there's an expectation that demand for ma magnet rare earths can be switched on quickly. Um, I think this is completely misled. I it will take years of investment, um, support to build capacity in the rare earth supply chain. And that means building the right mines, um, developing the refining and the separation and refining capacity um, to turn that into oxides, then metals, then magnets. So there's a lot of infrastructure that needs to be spent um, in order to be able to develop the magnets that are going to be required to enable um, this EV revolution. Um, I mentioned the right rare earth mines. Um, and this is something that I think um, the industry is starting to, to, to understand. It's not just about neodymium and praseodymium. There's a couple of other rare earths that are, that are required as well in those permanent magnets, uh, being dysprosium and terbium. Um, and so now it's, it's really a function of trying to get the right mines into development, um, support the development of a full supply chain. Uh, we saw last week, uh, the European Raw Materials Alliance, they announced a rare earth uh, magnets and um, motors cluster. And, you know, part of the program there, you know, the framework that they want to see to be able to do supply the rare earths and the permanent magnets that will be required uh, to effectively, um, you know, develop the motors uh, for the European market. I think the European market is forecast to be the largest EV market by the end of this decade. So, you know, there's, there's a huge appetite, there's a huge expectation, um, but in order to produce those rare earths to be able to feed into that, there's got to be substantial amount of investment in the industry, quick smart. Jeremy, I, from your perspective, looking at lithium, are you, are you echoing those thoughts? No, absolutely. I, I think um, it, there is growing concern among the auto, um, automotive industry, particularly, that they really haven't thought this through. Um, they thought, yes, we can build electric vehicles. Yes, of course we can. But where is this stuff going to come from? As they realise that actually um, the metals they need don't grow on trees. It's not simple to, to develop a mine. As Tim just said, it takes a long time to develop a mine. Um, and, and really, I think that the government, there's going to be need to be more government action. There already is a bit of government action, but probably not enough that uh, the EU and the and the US have published lists of critical raw materials of which lithium and most battery metals are on those lists, which just highlights um, the concern that governments are now showing. In fact, very recently, the International Energy Authority advised governments to start stockpiling these metals, which is a, an extraordinary uh, event that we've never seen for, for many, many decades, where we've just, uh, particularly, say, the UK has been uh, relied on in imports of everything and have outsourced such things as metals, uh, 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 thinking about uh, somebody else doing that dirty job, um, whereas we can't do that anymore. We, we've got to... Uh, mine and supply those metals in a clean, green, sustainable way. Uh, and, and we should be doing it domestically in both the UK and Europe. Thank you. Uh, Anne, let me come back to you. And how's, how's the nickel market reacting to this supply demand imbalance? Are you seeing our prices going up? Hopefully from your perspective they are, but what's the situation with nickel? Well, I think I think nickel's actually quite an interesting market anyway. I mean, I mean, the last time there was a, a sort of a huge surge for demand in nickel was sort of in, in the early noughties. 
Um, and and the and most of that demand was actually for stainless steel at that point. You know, and China came up with a, a what some people saw as a sort of a quick and easy way to fill that gap. You know, and that was actually with nickel pig iron, which was is a you know making a basically what used to be pig iron, adding nickel to it and making a very crude ferronickel that they could put into stainless steel. Now, there are people out there who think that maybe the Chinese can do something similar for, you know, for this um, surge in demand that we're going to see. But, you know, the Green Revolution is so different because the, the MPI that the Chinese made was, was exactly not what we need for the Green Revolution. You know, it was not clean. It was, it was a dirty method of creating a nickel to fill a gap that was needed. Um, so, you know, it's, there is a lot of um, there's a lot of nickel at the moment in Indonesia, and the Chinese have, are doing a lot of work in Indonesia, um, both for MPI because we have to remember that 70% of nickel still goes to that market. Stainless steel is a huge market for for nickel and always will be. There's growth there. As the world develops, we need stainless steel. Um, but in Indonesia, they're also looking at treating um, nickel laterites. Uh, with a with a hydrometallurgical route, uh, but again, it's high pressure, it's high temperatures. Um, it's not the most environmentally friendly way to to treat nickel. Um, and even if all the projects that the Chinese are looking at in Indonesia, we still won't have the supply that we need to meet the demand as we electrify vehicles. Um, so. You know, it comes back again to what both um, Jeremy and Tim have said there. When we start to look to the OEMs, the original equipment manufacturers who, who are building the automobiles, they want to know that the material they're buying is from a sustainable source. I think, you know, we're going to come on to talking about sustainability possibly later. Um, but they don't want, you know, they don't want people to look at, at you can already look at photographs of Indonesia on Google Earth and islands in Indonesia are a mess because of some of the nickel mining that's going on there. And we don't want to mine nickel that way. It has to be done responsibly. Um, so yes, I mean, to answer that, that there is a, at the moment, I think the, the auto manufacturers are realizing that there is going to be a huge shortage for nickel and cobalt. And if they can't just go to China to get it, then the prices, and we're seeing prices at the moment increase quite drastically compared to, um, I think we've seen prices this um, this year rising, not just for nickel, but for copper and, and you know, most base metals significantly compared to other years. And from what I'm reading and people I'm discussing it with, analysts feel that, you know, those prices are going to be with us for many years to come. So, um, but the projects, most projects outside of of Chinese capital, they need those prices as well to, um, you know, if you're going to do things in a sustainable, responsible way, then often it costs more money. And therefore, for lots of projects, um, we're actually slightly different. And again, I'll come on to that when we talk about sustainability. Um, but for lots of projects, they need those higher prices if we're going to get anywhere near the supply that we need uh, to meet the, the demand for, uh, for decarbonisation. I guess inevitably, in a discussion around electric vehicles and rare earths and lithium, we're going to be talking a lot about China, as we have already. Uh, and, and the four of you have already very politely alluded to the need for greater infrastructure to support, to support the industries. And I suppose we, we're getting into the realm of uh, geopolitics and whether the private sector alone can actually uh, start to compete uh, with the power of China. So I, I want to ask, I'm going to come to, to Tim and Jeremy on this one. Jeremy first, you know, what are the market conditions for entering uh, your sectors? And, and then is there funding, is there support available from either the EU or the UK to help companies like yours get off the ground? Jeremy, can I come to you first with that? Sure. Um, the, the conditions to entry to this market um, are very, very difficult. Um, because to try and source a new source of lithium, in my case, in Europe is very, very hard indeed. There are very few economically viable projects in Europe. Um, we are very lucky in Cornwall because this is a county in the UK with a 4,000 year history of metal production. And we will be um, building a, an open pit mine in an existing China clay pit. So it's not 
are going to be um, a new project uh, really at all. We're going to be uh, lucky enough to have a lot of infrastructure associated with that. But really it is a, a, um, a very difficult thing to get into. And almost you can count the number of projects in Europe on, on two hands, on your two fingers, you know, two, two, um, on, on two hands, really. So I think that what, what, you know, and it's really interesting, actually, there's, there's a, a new series in the FT today, the first article, which uh, says the electric vehicle revolution is fully here. It's one of the big reads. It just shows you how important um, big journals like the, 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 the FT are taking this. And one of the questions, one of the series, part four, will be actually batteries in China's bid to dominate. That, that addresses what you're saying. China is very determined to dominate this sector and to really um, build cars, build batteries there, and, and lock up the, the full raw material supply. So what that then sets the, the background for what is becoming an increasingly uh, large uh, global uh, political power struggle. And the UK has got this project called Project Defend, UK government, to really assess the supply chains across everything. Um, let's not talk about the petrol crisis here again. <laughs> but, um, and, 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 and we need to assess our supply chains very carefully. And, and I think the lithium, they said that UK government is finally starting to think about the lithium shortage and other metals, where are we going to get them from? Um, but I think it's a bit late to the table. And really, governments need to gear up. We have, there is some funding available um, for projects such as ourselves and the Faraday Battery Challenge um, from the um, various government sources, but it really needs, more needs to be done. And, and Europe uh, is ahead of the UK, is, is really pushing uh, funding for electric vehicles very, very hard. And, and I think that, that we need to see that uh, come through to the UK as well. So, but to, to summarize, it's conditions for entry are tough, um, funding and support from governments are very tough to secure, but it is there for those who persevere. Tim, a slightly odd one for you, but sitting down there in Australia, and thank you for joining us today, uh, operating in Uganda, are you seeing, are you aware, or what's your perspective on any available help from the EU or the UK? Oh, certainly. I think there's, there's growing desire to help develop the rare earth supply chain. Um, I think there's funding that's available, but I think there's also a, a growing understanding of, of the full um, requirement. It's not just building the mines, it's building the refining capacity, it's building the metal production capacity, and then it's building the magnet production capacity. So it's, you know, this is, this is, a, this is an industry that the Chinese have really uh, have cornered. You know, they've utilised uh, subsidies um, to build this strong... Uh, market within China, which is really under cut um, other suppliers globally. So to build um, alternative rare earth supply chain, um, it's going to require, yeah, stimulus money, it's going to require subsidies, it's going to require collaborations um, and long term commitments. And I think that um, certainly, as I mentioned previously, the European Raw Materials Alliance is, is one group. There are other um, initiatives in the UK and also in North America that are looking to help the right miners get into production to supply the rare earths that are going to be required. Um, and I think also when it comes to funding, um, I think from the private sector, um, there's, a, there's a growing understanding of what's coming down the line. You know, the demand for rare earths is probably, I think there's a figure of about eightfold increase expected um, just to supply the EVs, let alone the wind turbines, the offshore wind turbines. So there's, there's huge demand coming for, for rare earths. Um, the ability to produce that rare earth and, and the right rare earths is, I think, now what the, the investment community is trying to understand. They're doing a lot of work trying to understand what are the rare earth projects that they want to get involved in, what are the individual rare earth elements that they want exposure to, um, and because it's, it's, a, it's an industry that, you know, a lot of the investment community is not fully up to speed with. It's a little bit more of a bespoke um, commodity or technology metal. Um, yeah, it's taken some groups a little bit longer to get, the, to get up, the, up the knowledge curve. Um, but 
but I think you know as we as we move closer to the the, the point at which the penny drops, rare earth supply needs a lot of investment. Um, you've got to develop the right projects, and it will require support from governments and government bodies to make sure that the um, the environment is there that encourages the development of the right projects um, and to do it in a sustainable manner. There's a wonderful irony. We're talking about government involvement in a program which is entitled Revolution, but let's perhaps not go there. Um, Anne, you were mentioning a little while ago uh, about the fact that it's all very well to have these uh, green green metals and minerals which may give us a better quality of life, but you refer to the fact that there was the point of having them was lessened if they were being produced in a non-sustainable way. I want to come to Nigel Robinson as the, the guy on the panel who's actually there running mines which are producing. I, and I know, Nigel, you've already produced a couple of uh, environmental, social, governmental ESG reports looking at sustainability. Mm -hmm. um, what are the key things in sustainability and what are you doing to implement them at, uh, at, uh, at Central Asia Metals? Yeah, um, I mean, obviously, it's a key focus for our investors, all of our stakeholders, really, sustainability. And I guess you have to start from the premise of what do you mean by sustainability? First thing, to be a sustainable business, you have to be a profitable business. That's that's, that's fundamental, really, because you can't manage without, you know, uh, generating some kind of cash flow for the projects that you want to do. But when we look at sustainability as a, as a company, what we're looking at is how we look after the environment in which we operate, how we look after the communities where we operate, the governance aspect, as Jeremy said before, it's licensed to operate, which is fundamental to a mining company. Then obviously there's the other aspects of how you manage your people, health and safety on site and their well-being. So it's a broad topic is sustainability. And as you rightly said, Tim, what we've produced over the past couple of years is a couple of uh, sustainability reports. We're now doing it to what's known as GRI standards. Uh, and why is that important? I think it's important because it shows the focus that investors and stakeholders around the world want to see from mining companies. It's almost like a, a, an annual report, which as we know is done to, you know, high standards of being audited and the numbers themselves are checked and verified. I think in the past, maybe companies have maybe said things about what they're doing on the ground to do with the environment without that kind of detailed analytical rigor, which we've now got a focus on really, in terms of what are the trends of what you're doing in terms of your uh, usage of water potentially, any, you know, kind of emissions into the air, in particular greenhouse gas emissions, how you're measuring those and what the trend is, are you improving? So, so we recognize that probably two and a half years ago now from a lot of our investors and going to various conferences that this focus was, was becoming you know, very, very large indeed, actually. So we put a lot of effort into it. And I think what a lot of our investors said to us, you, we know that you do a good job on the ground. We've had a what was formerly called CSR director, which is corporate social responsibility, covering those aspects really, at the mine in Coonrad since, since we started producing back in 2012. So we've always had that presence to focus on those things, but now it needs to be more, more disclosure, more reporting, you know, more in the, in the investor's eyes. So that's why we focused on that. And also as we move and as we improve and as we set targets for things like greenhouse gas emissions, we're now looking at linking that into executive remuneration. So the executive team themselves are rewarded on how they perform against very specific sustainability targets. So that is a big change over the past two and a half years. At our sites themselves, I suppose the best example of sustainable mining, I would say, is Kunrad. We produce copper there from, from waste materials, effectively. These are old dumps that effectively had been mined from an open pit. And what we do is we leach the material there, and through a well-known process in the mining industry known as SXEW, solvent extraction, electro-winning, We've now produced in the past nine, nine years almost $750 million of revenue from what was effectively known as waste. We employ about 330 people. We've paid about $175 million in taxes in Kazakhstan. So that's a very sustainable angle to what we're currently doing in Kazakhstan. And I suppose the last thing really, as a lot of mining companies are looking at now, is, is how do we reduce our CO2 footprint? How do we, you know, in, improve our green, greenhouse gas emissions footprint effectively. And what we're doing there, we're, we're looking at uh, renewable electricity contracts in Macedonia. Uh, we've recently signed one from the 1st of July, which will make all of our electricity in Macedonia from a renewable source. So that's 100% improvement in our, uh, in our scope to emissions there. And in Kazakhstan itself, which is heavily you know, fossil fuel dependent as an economy 
and as a kind of power source, we're looking at building our own solar farm, which might contribute, say, 20 to 25 percent reduction in our CO2 footprint from the from the Cunard operation. Um, so, you know, we're doing doing what we can. We can't claim a net zero target. I don't think we're that kind of company, but certainly what we can do to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions and report on those things, improve the way we use use water, how we manage our waste. All these things are things that we're reporting to our shareholders. And I think it's been very well received. And, you know, that's part of this focus on sustainability. Thanks, Nigel. So a profitable miner uh, making money and doing it in a sustainable way as well. And as you move towards production of Brazilian nickel, what are you thinking about to make your operation sustainable? Yeah, well, obviously, I agree a lot with what Nigel was saying there. I mean, it's so important to all stakeholders at the moment, um, ESG in general. Um, you know, and, and, you know, I am a, my husband and I founded Brazilian Nickel, um, and this has always been very close to our heart. Um, it, it, sustainability, as we, I mean, a lot of people have a view, don't they, on mining, that it is, it, how can it be sustainable? Um, and in some respects, perhaps that's true, because, you know, the, the resources in the ground are finite. Um, so ultimately, whatever you build stops. But it's a case of, of when you are, what you are building on the ground is to, to make that as sustainable as it can be while it's there. So for us, what's always very important is, uh, is our local community, uh, the social side of sustainability. Um, you know, the, our, so our local stakeholders uh, are extremely important. Piauí is a very interesting part of Brazil. Uh, it's one of the poorest states in Brazil. Um, and so when we, at the moment we are building, we're constructing a very small production unit, which is the very first stage of, of our um, route to producing around 25,000 tonnes of nickel a year, uh, which that stage of the project will begin in about 2024. Uh, the smaller project, even the small project will employ 200, 250 people. Um, you know, and that's very important for a region where there's, you know, there's, there's basically no work, it's subsistence farming, it's, uh, you know, we're not in Amazonia, it's a very different part of Brazil. Um, so, but it, it, that side of, of mining is also very important, I think, the social side. Um, and I think something that's, uh, you know, as a, as a young company, we can set our targets and our goals as we go along, because we're developing. Um, and that is extremely important. That's going on also in Brazil at the moment. There's an awful lot of organizational development going on where we're actually setting the targets, then measuring against them. And we will report all of that information to all of our stakeholders as well, just as Nigel is doing that. You know, as a listed company, we're private at the moment, um, but we still behave in that responsible way to, to all our stakeholders. Um, I mean, if we come to, to the more environmental side, it's, um, you know, we heat leach our, you know, the nickel and cobalt um, in Brazilian nickel, and we do that for a reason. Um, we selected that process that's wherever we look to, to produce nickel, we will always look to heat leach. Um, and we do that because A, it's the, it is by far the cheapest way, which makes us, you know, it comes down again to that bottom to mine if you don't make money you can't put that back to your stakeholders and you can't create uh, a sustainable environment locally um, but it's also inherently lower co2 than most other nickel production routes for the oxide material the laterites which is where we're now having to go to produce nickel um, if you look at a these days there are there are um equivalent to like a cost curve, you know, yes, we're lowest quartile on the cost curve, but we're also lowest quartile on the CO2 emissions curve, the greenhouse gas curve. So we're already extremely low CO2 emissions, but we're also doing um, an awful lot of work on how do we reduce that even further. I mean, our vision is actually to try and reach to be carbon negative. So not just zero carbon, but negative. Uh, and we believe it is a vision, you know, it's, uh, I think, achieving carbon, zero carbon for our operations uh, should be possible. But there are many things that we can do to maybe even reach that negativity. 
you know, we, as part of our process, we actually emit CO2 because we use limestone in, in our metallurgical process to remove impurities, which gives off CO2. We're looking at, at how we capture that CO2 and either store it or use it. Uh, we have various research programs going on to do that. That would make us, just by doing that within our own process, would make us in for scope one and two, almost carbon zero. Uh, I think we'd be at about one kilo of, uh, of carbon per kilo of nickel produced. Um, so that then there's lots of smaller things around that that we can start to do to remove that, um, to make that you know even lower and possibly negative. And you know this is I, I think as we go forward, perhaps to come back to you know some of the stakeholders, investors, and and possibly again going back to auto manufacturers. You know I think in the future, if people can achieve you know, sort of really low carbon numbers, then there may even be a premium for that in the future on your product. Um, and we're talking already at the moment with many um, auto manufacturers who know they, as we said earlier, know they have to secure their supply. But if they can secure that supply and know that it is almost carbon zero, then obviously that adds to, to their... Um, uh, their, their sales pitch in a way for their you know people who are buying an electric vehicle they want it because it's not it's not emitting co2 but they don't want high co2 emissions for the materials that are going into it as well so i, th I think the the environmental side of sustainability is extremely important at the moment and you know and and it's um one of the key things certainly for us at brazilian nickel as we go forward and as I say, you know, we will be measuring, we will be setting these targets, measuring them and showing how we are, you know, beginning to reach uh, improvements as we aim to get those targets. Tim, what about you as you start to plan your uh, rare earths project in, uh, in Uganda? How are you thinking about making that sustainable? Yeah, so given the location, we've got access to low-cost hydroelectric power. There's, there's plenty of hydroelectric power in East, eastern Uganda, uh, which is then exported through, through East Africa. Um, from a water consumption, the process that we've selected is heap leach. Um, and again, it's uh, low energy, uh, low water consumption. So from, a, from an impact on the environment, we're trying to minimise um, our footprint. Um, when we look at the products that we produce, um, being magnet rare earths, about a third of our basket uh, being magnet rare earths, um, we're going to make the products that will go into you know, EV permanent motors, uh, permanent magnet motors, but also offshore wind turbines. Um, you know, on the current resource that we've got, we've probably got potential for about 90 gigawatts of offshore wind capacity in Makutu alone. Um, so that's a huge amount of potential offset um, and coal fired power stations that, that we can potentially displace. So we see Makutu as being a project that is quite important in helping global governments achieve milestones and targets with regards to um, carbon neutrality. Um, when we look at the sustainable development of Makutu, we're also looking at the way in which we rehabilitate um, the project area. So, you know, mentioned before, we're using heap leach processing. It's a very shallow deposit. Um, the residues from processing will be put back into the pit uh, and progressively rehabilitated. And we're looking at um, creating sustainable industries that will be there long after um, mining has has been completed and rehabilitated. So, you know, potentially at Makutu, we've got a multi-generational mine um, and, and ambitions to, you know, have extremely good stakeholder engagement, you know, predominantly Ugandan workforce. Um, so from a sustainability and, you know, engaging well with the, with the community um, and leaving a lasting legacy, you know, a lot of ambition there, um, and we're hopeful that with, with the work that we're able to complete over the next 12 months, we'll be able to talk more about, you know, some of the carbon targets that the project is likely to be able to achieve. Um, one of the, the trends, uh, themes emerging from the discussion we're having today 
is the fact that um, unless we're very careful, uh, demand is really going to outstrip supply. We're going to need access to more, more deposits, more metals, more minerals of the type that your four companies are all focused on. Now, mining is often seen as an ancient, low-tech uh, industry. I, right, we're all involved in it. We know not that's not the case. But Jeremy, I'm going to give you a very softball question here. Um, can, can technology really play a part in discovery and perhaps enhancing and accelerating the discovery of some of these green metals and minerals? Well, Tim, absolutely. And very interestingly, right at the beginning of this presentation, this, this panel discussion mentioned that we are on unprecedented times and, and, and indeed we are. And really that, that has focused the brains of uh, scientists all around the world to how can we focus on these new, these new discovery of these new metals and also processing these new metals. How can we do that? Until now, there was no in, imperative. You know, the electric vehicle revolution has created an imperative globally for people to start thinking about this. And what we've seen is um, technology really stepping up to that. Um, we are um, exploring in Cornwall, as, as I mentioned right at the beginning, and we are using really interesting cutting edge technologies such as satellite observation, uh, global information system, ge sorry, geographic information system software, which has only really come into its own in the last, say, five years in the way we're using it. And, and it also 3D uh, imagery, such as that provided by Sequent and Leapfrog, where we can take historical information and, and overlay it and integrate it with contemporary information from satellites, et cetera. And you're seeing a, a really the development of some amazing uh, um, targeting and, and discovery tools which can be used for that. And it's interesting that um, people like the Breakthrough Energy Fund, which is funded by Bill Gates and Jeff Bezos, et cetera, has just has backed a company to do precisely that, um, Cobalt Energy, to, to use uh, AI, to use satellite, to use all sorts of um, methods um, to discover new battery materials uh, deposits. And we, we, we're doing exactly the same. We're, we're using AI. Uh, we've got some very, very smart people in our team who are doing all that type of stuff. And also on the technology for, for extracting these minerals, um, we're, we're talking about really very interesting extraction techniques such as um, Anne and, and Nigel are using heat leach, um, and I think Tim mentioned that he will be too. This is sort of technology which was developed a while ago, but is, is coming into its own and being refined very quickly. We're going to be using what's called direct lithium extraction techniques to extract lithium from our brine. We're also using cutting edge uh, extraction technology for our hard rock process. But really, it, I, I, I call this coincidence. You've got technology coming together at a time of great imperative for the world. And actually, You've also overlay that with 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 um, with uh, re sustainability, responsibility, and and all that type of thing. Where you've, you, it's a coincidence. All these things have come together. We've really got to react, and people are stepping up. We, we've got some very interesting technology being developed in the UK. We're going to be uh, looking at that for actually increasing the yield out of our brines. It's a it's a very very exciting. Uh, time to see that mining is no longer this dirty, um, almost ancient industry. It's a high-tech, um, really interesting, exciting uh, sector to be in. And we, it's great to see so many young people being ex I I attracted to that uh, going forward. That's an uplifting note. Um, <laughs> we've had a wide-ranging discussion today uh, covering green metals. Um, but I want to end with a little quick fire round, if I can. Without, without the green metals that you're all involved in producing, um, what would be the impact on the ambitions which we have around the world for achieving net zero economies? How attainable are they really going to be? Quick fire round. Tim Harrison. Uh, impossible. Um, you know, without these battery metals and, you know, technology metals, uh, that are going to be required to to achieve carbon neutrality. It's it's fanciful. 
it's fanciful to think that uh, these these targets can be reached. So it really is um, now upon um, upon the industry and governments to to get cracking and let's build the capacity. Impossible. And Oxley, do you agree? I do. It simply can't happen in the time frame that we need it to. You know, without those metals being there within that time frame. You know, I, I think you know, what Tim just said there is key. You know, I mean, we, just to go back to, to nickel and cobalt, there's plenty of nickel and cobalt out there in the ground. It's just getting it out in a timely manner and obviously in a sustainable manner. But the, you know, I think that, you know, there's something like at least 300, 400 billion dollars being spent by OEMs at the moment, you know, on electrification of vehicles. And in the nickel industry, there's probably, if we're really lucky, in the next 10 years, maybe 50 billion being spent. It's not enough to make to match that uh, that need. Nigel, what's your view from the, the copper well, perspective? You're, you're certainly not going to get dissent from me on that. Impossible, impossible, impossible. I mean, clearly, the world needs these metals. I think what's interesting is, you know, lots of countries and lots of big companies now have got these aspirational targets to get to net zero by 2050, 2060, whatever it is. And that's right. That's the direction of travel. I think that provides, a, you know, an impetus for us all to do things slightly better. But um, as Jeremy was saying there, I, sadly, the mining industry itself has got its pretty negative perception about mining from, you know, historical incidents may be, or it's a dirty industry. And therefore, the ratings agencies on sustainability, things like MSCI and sustainability, you always start from a very negative perception of mining, you know, so your score is even if you're doing really well, your score is generally not that great, to be honest with you, which is which is sad. And I think the world has to recognise that we cannot get to this change that we all want without mining. You just cannot get there without mining the various metals. And there's a whole host of them that we talked about this morning. So, yes, mining can do better. I think, it, you know, some of that perception is, is, is justified because of some incidents or whatever. So mining can improve you know, and, and clean up its act, so to speak, by doing things more environmentally friendlier, using technology, as Jeremy says, and innovating, looking after communities better, et cetera. So we can all do things better than that. But yeah, without, without the, the mining industry, we will never get to a better world, world position that we, want, that we all want to get to for our children, effectively. And, you know, sadly, many of the ESG-specific funds are pretty resistant to investing in mining, which is a bit ironic when you think about it. that's the that's what they need to invest in really to give us the money to 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 innovate and use the technology to get to this 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 greater greener world that we all want to get to. And you know, mining is key to that, absolutely key to it. So uh, so yeah, no dissension for me, and absolutely impossible without mining. What a great note to end on. Uh, thank you all. Um, that's it for this edition of Driving the Revolution with Blindway Business News. It simply falls to me to thank our panellists, Nigel Robinson of Central Ledger Metals, Tim Harrison of Ionic Rare Earths, Anne Oxley of Brazilian Nickel, and Jeremy Rathall of Cornish Lithium. Um, we'll be following this topic time and time again, but thanks for watching. <laughs>